Recently, there has been much attention given to a celebrity figure, Prince Rogers Nelson, who is widely known as a musician simply as Prince. I don't know a lot about Prince, except that I know that he has been a noted figure in the music world for a long time, though I didn't follow him that closely, not particularly interested in his genre of music. But I know that to many he was a very talented musician, and he had many fans. He died a few days ago at the age of 57. Like a lot of celebrity figures, he died rather young. I remember when I was a teenager and my granddaddy passed away at the age of 58. Way back then, I thought 58 sounded old. Now I know that it's not. But Prince passed away and a lot of attention has been given to that and I understand why. He was a noted figure in the music industry and I'm saddened when, when anybody passes away and particularly when they are younger having not lived a long full life. But we note that the name Prince, well known to a lot of people. If you ask somebody on the street, did you hear Prince died? These people would say, yes, we heard that and many very sad over that news. The title Prince, We've heard it all of our lives. Speaks of royalty, doesn't it? And thus we speak of members of a royal family. For example, in Great Britain you have the monarch Queen Elizabeth II who just recently turned 90. She's lived a long life and experienced a long reign as the British monarch. Those who are in line to succeed her her son, Prince Charles, her grandson, Prince William, her great-grandson, Prince George. Now the problem is they may never become the monarch because they've got to outlive Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> and that looks like that's going to be a difficult thing to do. But we understand those titles among royalty such as Prince. So I'm speaking today about a prince. But it's not Prince the musician, not going to denigrate him in any way. I don't have any reason to do that. I'm not speaking about uh, British royalty today, though I find them rather interesting to follow. But I am speaking today about a Prince who means more to me than all the world. I'm speaking of one that is called in the Scriptures the Prince of peace. I would trust that you know him. And if you do, you know that he is truly royal. The most noble one who ever walked the face of this earth. And don't we love him? The Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9 6, these words are recorded by the prophet. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's not one prophet speaking to another prophet. That's members of the divine Godhead speaking of another member of the Godhead. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Everlasting Father, the Mighty God, the Prince of of peace. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And therefore all of us who claim to follow Him ought to be interested in this word peace. You see, the psalmist would write about a peaceful people. The psalmist would talk about how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalm 133, 1. Therefore, because these brethren dwell together in unity, they have peace. 
In the New Testament, Paul would write, Be ye all of one mind and live in peace. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. The opposite of peace is strife and discord, confusion and war. Christians seek after those things that make peace. Just to illustrate how our God is a God of peace, consider that in the regulation of spiritual gifts as recorded in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul speaking about these gifts in the assembly, the very last verse of 1 Corinthians 14 is verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done in the proper manner, in an orderly way. We would expect that in the assembly of the God of peace. But when we hear this word peace mentioned today, at least when we are listening to the news or, or we're reading about what's happening in the world, we often are hearing about those who disrupt peace, aren't we? We read about those who disrupt peace in our communities. Sometimes in the nations of the world, they are, they are war-torn and war-weary, by the way. But those of us who are Christians, we, we regularly pray for peace. I can recall as a boy, and I recall even to the present hour, that Christian men have stood in an assembly like this and often prayed for peace. The prayer may be as follows, Father in heaven, bless the leaders of the world and we pray for peace on earth. Now good, decent leaders are interested in peace. I can recall back in the 1980s, it was during the Christmas season, and President Ronald Reagan was having a press conference and he was asked this question at the close of the press conference. Mr. President, what would you like to have for Christmas? And President Reagan in that typical smile said, well, I think you know as the leader of the free world, I would really like to have peace on earth as a Christmas present. The reporter continued and asked this question. Yes, but what do you want in a box? And President Reagan quipped, if I can get it in a box, I'll take it in a box, right? <laughs> Any way I can get it. A good, decent leader. And not all leaders are good and not all leaders are decent. But those who are really do desire peace. But biblical peace, that which is given by the Prince of Peace, involves something that's inward. So keep that in mind when you study. Yes, the Bible addresses peace in the nation, peace throughout the world. But primarily when you study this word peace in the Old and New Testaments, you're reading about inner peace and peace with God. Now racism is vile. That's been a problem for man from early on, and sadly, I guess it always will be. Despite the fact that the Bible clearly teaches that from one blood God made all the nations of the earth. Paul said that in Athens, Acts 17, 26. That's a vile, wicked sin to harbor racism in one's heart. But I think about God's people. I think about here at Forest Hill. I think about the Memphis School of Preaching. I don't believe we have that problem because we understand that each person, regardless of his racial background, regardless from what part of the world, he may be a native. He's precious in the sight of God. Here at this place, we have people come together on the Lord's Day and daily to study that are from different races, different countries of the world, and we sit down and we study in peace and harmony because, you see, these barriers that separate people out in the world have been broken down in Jesus Christ, Galatians 3.28, and therefore we are at peace. This morning in the message, 
I want us to see how the divine Godhead is not only interested in peace, but how involved each member of the Godhead has been and is in bringing about true, genuine peace. Because Isaiah 9, 6 makes it clear that all three members of the divine Godhead work together. And they work together for good. And therefore, they are interested in peace. I want you to see, first of all, how the God, how God, who is the Father, initiates peace. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33, we learn this about God the Father. He is not the author of confusion, but rather he's the author of peace. Let's notice how God initiated peace with man. Look at Romans chapter 5, beautiful passage that means so much to those of us who are found in Christ. Remember verse 6 beginning, For yet when ye were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still alienated from God, at war with him, God took the initiative to save us. God took the initiative to restore peace between himself and man, even though God never did anything to disrupt that peace. God always sought our good. God always wanted a beautiful, harmonious relationship with man. And yet we, part of humanity, rebelled against him. And thus, the peace was broken. But God is the one who initiates peace. You think about the heathen nations of the world that make gods unto themselves. They go seeking after a God, don't they? But the true God of the Bible came seeking after us. He took the initiative, not us. And so the first point in the message is God the Father who initiates peace. Therefore, in the second chapter of Luke, something that I would have loved love to have beheld is to have been in that pasture when those shepherds who were watching their flocks all of a sudden heard the heavenly host sing these beautiful words, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Why were they singing this? Because a Savior had been born. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The Prince of Peace has now come in to the world. God the Father taking the initiative to save mankind. You know wisdom, divine wisdom comes from God. Listen to this passage from the book of wisdom in Proverbs 3.17. Speaking of wisdom, her ways are pleasantness and all her paths are peace. That's a beautiful passage. Beautiful maxim. Something to remember every day you live. The ways of wisdom, pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. And so I want you to, to consider that God the Father is the one who initiates peace. But let's consider the second member of the divine Godhead, Christ Jesus the Son. He is the one who implemented peace. In Romans chapter 5, we return to that particular chapter, and I want you to notice the very first verse in Romans chapter 5. The subject is justification, standing right before God. We are justified, the text says, by a system called the faith system. Therefore, being justified by faith, look at this, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why does peace need to be restored in this relationship? Why is this the primary theme of the Bible? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, sin separates, doesn't it? Sin separates us from God, and therefore there is no more peace. 
You remember in James 4, 4, James writes, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, and spiritual adultery is what's under consideration. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore is a friend of this world is the enemy of God. You see, this world also has a prince, doesn't it? In fact, Jesus spoke of the prince of the power of the air and spoke of the prince of this world. That's the devil, isn't it? The devil is the prince of this world and he has a philosophy, doesn't he? Colossians 2.8, we are to beware of that philosophy, the philosophy of the world. Not only that, this old world has a people too, doesn't it? This world has a prince, it has a philosophy, it has a people all running against Jesus Christ and His teachings. All doing battle with the Lord. Now this world is an ungodly system over which the devil reigns. 1 John 5, 19. And so Jesus, the Prince of Peace, came to defeat the Prince of of darkness, enmity, James writes, enmity with God, at war with Him, in rebellion with Him, hostile toward Him. Romans 3.17, speaking of a world that is alienated from God and the way of peace they have not known. That's the world in which we live. Now, consider just for a moment in our own relationships. Have you ever had a relationship where a friendship is no more, where harm has come to a relationship, where a cordial relationship all of a sudden is disrupted. So many times that's a problem with both individuals involved. I realize sometimes a person could be innocent and someone that that person thought was a friend becomes rather abusive and hostile and mean-spirited and the friendship is no more. But so many times when a friendship is, is dissolved, two people are in the wrong. Maybe one person is the one who disrupted the friendship but the other didn't respond properly. I don't know. But I will say this, that God never at one time provoked us to be hostile toward Him. Never did. There was nothing that God ever did that would provoke us to be at war with Him. Remember point one. He took the initiative to make peace between Himself and man. But we need to understand that it is not God that needs to be reconciled to man. Man needs to be reconciled to God. Because man is the one who has disrupted that peace. Now he took the initiative. And that's clearly seen in the sending of Christ. And that's why our second point is Christ is the one who implemented peace. God took the initiative in making peace by sending Christ who implemented peace. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and notice verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so all down through history, God has been seeking a relationship with man. He's been seeking to restore man to himself. And he reconciles man unto himself through his son Jesus Christ, who, verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5, it states He was made to be sin for us. That is the sin offering for us. The one who knew no sin. So it is Christ Jesus who, who implemented this plan of God's for peace. Now let's notice how that was done. I want you to go with me to the second chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. And beginning in verse 13, notice these words of reconciliation. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The context here is the Jew and Gentile being brought together. 
the Gentiles being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, verse 12. Those of you who are, who are far off, you have been brought near because of the blood of Jesus. Now notice verse 14, for he is our peace. He is our peace who hath made both one, both Jew and Gentile. He hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. There's our word again from James 4.4. 4. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. But Jesus has abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making, what's the word? Peace, so making peace. There's the second time that word, the word upon which we are focusing today is found. He made peace. So Jew and Gentile now come together in peace through him. Now how did he do that? That's a mighty big accomplishment. Verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. What's the body? The body's the church, isn't it? Ephesians 1 closes with Jesus being given much glory and honor as the head of the body, which is the church. So he reconciles both in one body. By what means? The cross. For when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he did more than just pay our sin debt. Now that's big, especially to each one of us as individuals, to know that our sins were paid by Jesus through the shedding of his blood. But consider also that when Jesus died, he provided a new and better covenant, Hebrews 9, 15. And not only that, he purchased the church, Ephesians 5, 25. And so the church is blood bought. So he has reconciled both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body, that's the church, by or through the cross, listen to this, having slain what? The enmity, remember that word enmity, that speaks of war between two parties, having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached, here's our word again, peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. When Jesus came, he had a message. His message was peace or reconciliation with God. He preached it to Jew and likewise it was for Gentile. To those who were near, to those who were far off. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now that's a beautiful passage. Those verses tell us how Jesus reconciled man unto God. How now that peace has been restored between the two. And likewise, how that peace is found by being in the body of Christ, which is the church. Now, with that thought in mind, I want you to go with me back to an Old Testament passage for just a brief moment. And that Old Testament passage is found in the book of Isaiah. And I want you to notice this particular prophecy that has to do with the establishment of the house of God, which we know is the church of Christ. In verse 2 of Isaiah 2, listen to what it says. It shall come to pass in the last days, now the last days, that's when Jesus came, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Paul said, the house of the Lord is the church of the living God. It is fascinating to study the church of our Lord for the church always was in God's mind with regard to his salvation of mankind. And so here in this passage we read, Many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. The mountain of the Lord speaks of God's authority. To the house of the God of Jacob. That's the church that was promised. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. Who, who learns of his ways? Who walks in his paths? Those who make up this house, which is the church. For out of Zion or Jerusalem shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Zion or from Jerusalem, reference to Acts 2 and the preaching of the gospel. And then notice, he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And here's the glorious result. 
They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Where is all this happening? In God's spiritual kingdom. Isaiah is speaking of the peaceful nature of the kingdom of God. And therefore, Paul will write, the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. No. We're in a battle, but it's spiritual in nature. And we are inviting others to come and be part of the peaceful kingdom, whereby you can really know peace, genuine, real, that only Christ can provide. What I'm saying to you this morning, dear friends, is this. The primary focus of peace in the Bible is peace within. It's peace within. It is peace that says, I'm right with God. I've been reconciled to the God of heaven. And if I'm right with God, everything's right. Everything's right. But if I'm, right, if I'm not right with God, if there's no peace between us, then there's no peace anywhere. I've got to be right with Jesus. And through the blood of Jesus, we have peace with God. Now, what have we noticed thus far? We're talking about the divine Godhead being interested in peace. God the Father initiates peace. God the Son is the one who has implemented peace. Through Him, we have reconciliation with God. But here's the third point. It is the Holy Spirit that instills peace. Now, by that, I don't mean that the Holy Spirit does this miraculously. I do not mean that the Holy Spirit does this miraculously or directly. But the Holy Spirit does this through inspired revelation. How so? I want you to notice with me in Philippians chapter 4 something that Paul is talking about that's very important for us to learn. He begins this chapter very concerned about two people in the church at Philippi who were having some strife between them. Now here's what's important to understand. The church at Philippi was a great church, sound in the faith, evidently involved in a lot of good works. But you know when the devil looks at a congregation that is seemingly at peace and a congregation that's sound in the faith and a congregation that is engaged in good works, he's got to do something to disrupt that. So if he can't get these brethren to change their doctrine and if he can't get them to stop engaging in good works, maybe he just needs to stir something up among the brethren. That's what he'd like to do. And so Paul says, you tell these two to get their act together. They need to come together and be of one mind. Don't be arguing and fussing and griping and complaining about each other. Then he talks about rejoicing in the Lord, verse 4. And then in verse 6, he talks about the importance of prayer. Don't be anxious over anything, he says. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now listen to verse 7. And the peace of God. That's different from Romans 5, 1 when we read about peace with God. Peace with God comes through reconciliation, which comes through Jesus. Now he's talking about the peace of God. The peace of God which passeth all understanding. That is human understanding. Hard to comprehend it. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How is it that you and I have the peace of God? Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report and virtuous and praiseworthy, think on these things. I want to tell you something, friends. When you see somebody who thinks this way, you'll find a person at peace. You will find a person who has peace within. They have the peace of God. How do they have it? They've instilled the Spirit's revelation in their heart and mind and life. And that brings peace. When I am anxious within my spirit, within my soul, I know exactly what's happening. I haven't been as close to the Lord as I ought to be. When I become anxious, when uh, not only I become anxious within, I become stirred 
on the outside as well. And I'm not at peace. Even though I fully understand that Christ Jesus died for me and I'm at peace with God, why am I suffering on the inside? It's because I probably need to get back down on my knees again and start praying more. It's probably because during those moments I need to quit preaching to you so much and start preaching to self again. Peace of God comes through my meditation of God's holy word. It comes through a prayerful attitude that I maintain. If I've been reconciled unto God through Jesus Christ, then I want to stay close to God. So the peace of God will rule in my heart. Now with that in mind, look at this passage in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Notice that the Word of God is quick or alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Somebody comes to me and says, Brother Grider, I am concerned about my soul. I'm concerned because I've engaged in some particular practice that I know wasn't right and my conscience is bothering me. The first thing I say to such a brother or a sister is this, be thankful that's what's happening. Because there are people who engage in open rebellion against God and do not care. They don't care. Oh, they go right on to bed and sleep at night because they don't care about God. But you're a child of God. And when you do something that's not in harmony with God's will, it ought to bother you on the inside. It ought to disrupt your peace. But the good news is, through Jesus Christ, that peace can, can be restored. Oh, that's why we maintain a constant, a constant uh, uh, mind toward repentance. And why we continually want to be in prayer confessing our wrongs so that the peace of God will remain with us. The peace of God. You see, the divine Godhead is interested in peace. Are you? If God's interested in peace, you must be interested in peace. God the Father's initiated it. God the Son has, has implemented it. God the Holy Spirit has instilled it. And I want to tell you, when Jesus came to this earth, He came to offer you a gift and to offer me a gift. What is that? His peace. He said that to his disciples. My peace I give to you. My peace. It's not something that the world knows or understands. It's from above. It's, it's my peace and it's my gift to you. John 14, 27. This is genuine peace. It's what's real. And friends, I pray you have it today. Because if you've got the peace of God reigning in your hearts, it means you're at peace with God. And that's the only way to live. In a war-torn, bitter, sin-sick world, the only way to make it is by knowing God and having His peace rule within. You can have that peace. You can. It's available to you if you'll only come to the giver of peace, the author of peace, that is the God of heaven. You'll never have peace of mind and peace at heart until you come to him in his appointed way. Why not this morning be found in Christ? Come repenting of your sins. Confess Jesus. Be baptized so that all your sins can be washed away. And I tell you, based upon the authority of the word of God, that's what will happen when you come to Jesus as he's instructed. If you're a child of God this morning and you're anxious within, I don't know the reasons why you're so anxious, but I'm sure you're going through a difficult time. Maybe, just maybe, what would help you is knowing that your brethren are praying for you. And that's another reason we gather here as we do regularly, to encourage, to pray for one another. Come to Christ. Confession make. Come to Christ. And pardon take, have peace of mind.
have peace in your soul. Even now, as together we